It is great to have you here with us today. Thanks for coming out. Thanks to everyone that is watching online today and love the news about the outdoor services uh, next week. We hope you'll make it out for that. Again, 10 o'clock here, 10 o'clock in Noblesville. Pray for great weather. All right, we're going to pray for some great weather because this may be something that we do uh, for just a little bit. But uh, we are glad to have you with us today. We're continuing in our series called Knowing Jesus. And if you want to follow along with us, uh, turn to Luke chapter 4 in your Bibles. Uh, If you use a a Bible app, go to Luke chapter 4. And uh, writer and pastor Max Lucado begins his book, Just Like Jesus, with this powerful challenge. I want to read it for you. Here's what he writes. He says, what if for one day Jesus were to become you? What if for 24 hours Jesus wakes up in your bed, walks in your shoes, lives in your house, and assumes your schedule? Your boss becomes his boss. Your mother becomes his mother. Your pains become his pains with one exception. Nothing about your life changes. Your health doesn't change, your circumstances don't change, your schedule isn't altered, your problems aren't solved, nothing changes. It's this question. Think about it like this. What if your heart for one day was replaced by the heart of Christ? What would you be like? Your heart gets the day off. Your your life is led by the heart and passion of Jesus. His priorities govern your actions. His passions drive your decisions. His love directs your behavior. How would you spend your time each day? Uh, How how would Jesus harden you, change the way you approach or think about the people that you work with or around, maybe about your neighbors? How would would Jesus hard uh, influence your attitude about school, uh, about teachers, uh, administrators, or other students? How how might that change? Uh, How might Jesus harden you, influence the way you respond to other people, the way you function on something like social media? Like, would would it have any impact on what you worry about? What gets you anxious? How might his influence, uh, his heart influence the way you view your money, your house, your cars, everything you have? Would his heart influence the way you think about wearing a mask even during a pandemic like this? What if your heart for one day was replaced by the heart of Christ? What would you be like? It's an interesting question if you think about it. Uh, It'll mess with you. And it probably should, every one of us. But the truth is, the truth is that our heart should look more and more like Jesus uh, each and every day as we get to know him better. And that's what this Knowing Jesus series is all about. Like we, you could say that we want to understand his heart so that we can know him better, so that we can model our lives after him. And uh, if you've been following along with us in this series, we've been looking at the gospel of John these last few weeks, studying through a key time uh, in Jesus' life and ministry. Well, we're gonna switch over to the gospel of Luke today. And Luke is going to walk us through another important event in the life of Jesus, an event that has the, uh, something significant, I believe, to teach us about Jesus' heart, but can also teach us something about ours as well. And so let's pick it up together in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Here's what the historian and gospel writer Luke records for us. He says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Now stop there for a second, because I don't think Luke is just throwing in colorful words here, but he's being very intentional in recording that Jesus is operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, that he's not just making random decisions decisions on his own, but that he's living his life fully surrendered to God and therefore responding as the Spirit leads him. Luke writes, and news about Jesus spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Now, Galilee uh, served as a great uh, teaching center and training ground for Jesus and his disciples, and it was strategic for a number of different reasons. And just to go back to a map that we uh, reference uh, frequently, uh, Jerusalem here is at the, the center of Israel. Galilee is this region to the north around the Sea of Galilee where Jesus is going to spend a number of days. There are a number of events that come out of the Gospels that have everything to do with this region 
called Galilee. And the historian Josephus records that there were approximately 3 million people that lived in this region during the time of Jesus and something like 200 different towns, again, around the area that we know as Galilee. Add to that three major roads from history passed through this region. There was a north-south road uh, that the individuals from Galilee would use in order to make their, their trips to Jerusalem. There was a road called the Via Maris, or the Way of the Sea, that passed along, this being the Mediterranean Sea here, but it passed along this western coast of Israel so that people from Egypt could access Rome to the north and vice versa. And then a third major route that came down out of Rome through Galilee and then down to the the southeast or to the area that we know as Arabia. And so the point is this, that there were so many lives to be influenced, not only the residents that lived in the region of Galilee, but all of the people that were passing in and out of the region each and every day. It was a strategic location. All right, God was doing something strategic in bringing Jesus there. And according to Luke, Jesus was teaching in their synagogues. Now, synagogues grew up during the exile when the Jews no longer had a temple that they could worship in, but these synagogues continued even after the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt. And Jewish law said that any town that had at least 10 families could have a synagogue. And the synagogue was a place where people came on the Sabbath to worship, much like we're doing today but it also served as a training school for students throughout the week. And they didn't have assigned pastors or staff necessarily at the synagogue, but rather visiting rabbis passing through would travel from town to town, teaching in the different synagogues. And there were synagogues all throughout Galilee. And so as Luke records, Jesus is going to those synagogues, he's teaching in them, and he's going to make a trip to a familiar location. Check out verse 16. Luke writes, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Now, the words where he had been brought up are significant to the event that we are going to look at today because, and you might remember, Nazareth is Jesus' hometown. And he wasn't born in Nazareth, but this is where he spent his childhood, his young adult years. And we don't know a lot about those years of his life, but what we do know is especially important. And Psalm 69 from the Old Testament shed some light on what Jesus endured growing up in Nazareth. It's what we would call a messianic psalm. And check out just a few of these verses from Psalm 69 that have a little to say about Jesus growing up in Nazareth. The writer says this, for I, for Jesus, endure scorn for your sake and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me and the insult of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me and I am the song of the drunkards. What a stark picture of what Jesus' childhood was like. He endured scorn for God's sake. Notice the words. He says, I am like a foreigner amongst my own family, uh, bullied, if you would, by the drunkards. And why? Well, Nazareth was a small town, maybe 200 people or so, and everyone knew that Mary got pregnant, but not by Joseph, supposedly, And so did they taunt him for that? Was that the reason for the ridicule? I mean, there's no doubt that Jesus felt the weight of being different and some loneliness that came with that, even in his very own home. Now back to verse 16. Again, he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read. Now, we get excited for Pancake Sunday at Genesis, right? That brings out the crowd or uh, something like the outdoor worship service next week. That's what we're praying for. But imagine the excitement of knowing that Jesus is gonna speak at your service, all right? That's a big deal, right? That's gonna bring a crowd. And, and a typical Sabbath service involved the following. They had their time of worship where a prayer was offered. There was some reading of the 
Psalms. The people would recite the Shema together. Uh, There would be a reading of scripture. And this is where the visiting rabbi, as noted here, would stand up to read, much like Jesus is doing. Following that was a, a message or some commentary on the scripture. And the visiting rabbi would typically handle that too. And then finally, there was a closing benediction to the service. And so again, Jesus is the visiting rabbi. And when the appropriate time in the service came, the attendant would go over to the holy ark, remove the scroll, open it to the designated place of reading, and hand it to the one assigned to read. And so picture Jesus, if you would. He receives the scroll, stands, and all the people are watching. There's dads there, there are moms there, there are kids, there are teens. Jesus' family is probably in the synagogue as well. Many of them that had watched Jesus grow up, And they remember the controversy and the rumors about his birth, but they've also heard this fascinating news that he changed water to wine at Cana. The word is that he healed the nobleman's son, the man from Capernaum, and all of his teaching. And now their eyes are fixed on him as Jesus begins to read. And here's what Luke records in Luke chapter four, beginning in verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, was handed to Jesus. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And these words from the book of Isaiah, Jesus read them for the people present. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you know what? If you're in the crowd that day and you're listening to Jesus read these words, you're thinking, ah, yes. Like those are good words. Like we remember those words. We hold on to the words. The words Jesus read had been passed down for centuries now. They were first shared during a difficult time in Israel's past when Israel was prisoner to the Babylonian empire. And so these words were meant to bring hope, to remind them of hope. They pointed to a day when God would send his son, would send a Messiah, a savior to the world, someone who would come and make things right again and set the people free from their sins. And so Jesus read them and then look in verse 20, what Mark records next. Then he, then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now, by the way, sitting down was the proper way of teaching for a rabbi like this. We stand to teach, they would sit to teach. Basically, Jesus is going to give a message now. And then Luke writes, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And what's Jesus saying? You can see it for yourself. Jesus is saying, it's me. I'm the Messiah. I'm the promised one of long ago, the one Isaiah spoke about. And here's what I've come to do. Jesus says, the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. Now, when we think of the word poor, we typically think financially poor. In this situation, really more of the emphasis is on a a, a moral and, and spiritual poverty. That's what Jesus has come for. He says, he has sent me, God has, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the the prisoners of war, if you would. It's the hurting. Uh, Jesus is talking about the broken and abused. Today, we think about people who are held captive to things like money, uh, guilt from the past, pleasure, uh, addictions of any kind, fear and hate. Jesus says, you know what? I've come to free people from these things once and for all. He says, I have come for recovery of the sight for the blind. You know, Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind, those who aren't able to see beyond their own circumstances in life. He he came to lead uh, his people from the darkness and in to the light. Jesus says, I've come to set the oppressed free. The oppressed represents anyone in life who has been shattered or, or broken to pieces. It's people who have been devastated by a crisis or one event after another. And Jesus says, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is a reference to Leviticus chapter 25 and what the Jews knew as the year of Jubilee, the year when debts were canceled and forgiven, slaves were set free. I hope you can imagine the enthusiasm. All right, there should have been some enthusiasm. They're like, who would get behind a message and a man like that? But do you know what? It's what Jesus didn't say 
that started to mess with them a bit. Because again, Jesus was reading from the book of Isaiah. They all knew Isaiah well. In fact, many of them likely had it memorized. And because they knew it so well, many, if not all, recognized not only what Jesus said, but what he didn't say, what he left out. And that's important too, because look at, if you read it in Isaiah 61, look at the conclusion, if you would, of this particular text and what Jesus omitted. We read, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. And so that got their attention a little bit. Maybe even got some whispers going around the room. Like, can you hear him saying, like, why did Jesus leave off the last part? What, what about the vengeance part? Remember, these people are living in a time of great oppression. Rome ruled the world, all right, and ruled with a heavy hand. And so many, if not all, were suffering in really personal ways. And so they had some very high expectations for a Messiah like Jesus. And I'm not saying they didn't love the good news. They loved the good news to the poor, to the, to the prisoners, to set the captives free, the forgiveness of sins. But they also expected the Messiah, the Messiah to roll some heads along the way too, all right, to set things right once and for all. And so why did Jesus stop reading just short of the vengeance part? Well, it wasn't because he doubted the vengeance or that he was uncomfortable bringing a message like that on a Sabbath morning, but potentially, rather as N.T. Wright, he's a scholar and teacher, points out, he says this, you know, Jesus seems to have drawn on the larger picture in Isaiah and elsewhere, which speaks to the people of Israel being called as a light to the world and to the nations, that Israel had a specific part to play in God's redemption plan, that Jesus didn't come to inflict punishment on the nations. That's something that God's gonna deal with after the second coming of Jesus, but that Jesus came to offer us a way out of the vengeance that was to come. And at that, Jesus sat down ready to teach and watch how the people react. Luke writes, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And this can be a confusing verse to translate because it seems to give light that they were all about Jesus and they were all about his message. And there's some truth in that. There was amazement. Some translations say marveled, again, at his gracious words and how he spoke them. But it's almost like there's a break in attitude after the period, because then you read, isn't this Joseph's son? Or as some have suggested, that you could imagine people saying, wasn't Joseph just a carpenter? And this is Jesus, like that's, that's the trade he grew up learning to do. Like, wait a second, you're the one whose mom didn't get pregnant by Joseph, right? But there's this story of an angel. Isn't that what they told us? And so the idea is that something's happening in the synagogue. Like they were initially drawn into Jesus' words, but their, their interest has quickly turned to some doubts and cynicism. And you can't help but wonder if, if somebody brought up signs or miracles at that moment. Like, can't you hear someone say, you know what, Jesus? If this is true, we're gonna need you to prove it. We're going we're gonna to need to see a miracle. We're going to need to see a sign. We want to see something like what happened in Cana or something that happened with the Capernaum family. And if you stop there for a second and if you just think about how Jesus could have responded. Like he's surrounded by a crowd of people that have mocked and insulted him for years. They're at it again. Man, if I'm Jesus, it's not going to take much for me to flash a miracle or two and to prove them wrong once and for all. The temptation has to be there. But instead, Jesus is going to continue with his teaching. And we learn a little bit about his message to them in these words, beginning in verse 23. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself, and you'll tell me, uh, do in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. 
He said, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel, he continues, with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the, Assyri the Syrian. And so Jesus takes them back to a couple of events from past that represented very dark days in history, Israel's history, their unfaithfulness, their sin. And what does God do? He takes key people and takes them even outside of the Jewish people to the Gentiles and does something good does something amazing. Jesus is showing us how great, how wide God's love is, and not just for the Jews, but for all people. Don't miss what Jesus is doing here. He is rebuking them for their, for their lack of faith. Jesus has just walked into his hometown, into his home church, and insulted these people for their fake, phony, small faith in God. And with that, the people of Israel or Nazareth had had enough. They watched Jesus grow from a young boy to a man they never dreamed he was God. And now he's crossed a line with them. Luke writes, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they had heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. How big of a Patriots fan would I have to be, all right, for you to rush me right out of here after the service and try such a thing? But look what Jesus did. It says, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. And so what are we supposed to learn from an event like this today? What, what, are, what is it that we ought to see that maybe God has for us this morning as we think about the heart of Jesus from this passage? I, I think you can conclude many things. I mean, there is certainly something to say about the patience of Jesus. Uh, there's much we could say about his humility, about his graciousness, uh, about his passion for the message, the work that he came to do, certainly his compassion for people who are hurting or lost or far from God. And at the same time, his willingness to speak the truth, even if it meant he would ultimately be rejected. But one of the main priorities that we see in Jesus' life time and time again is that he was always exalting the Father. That, that, that just means that in everything he said and in everything that he did, he, was, he wasn't trying to bring attention to himself, but that in everything and in all of his teachings, he was always working to bring glory to God. And that's true in this sequence of events too. And so what's that mean to us? Like, what are we supposed to take from something like this today? Well, I think if you and I, if we're gonna know him, if we're gonna know Jesus, if, if you and I are gonna model our lives after Jesus, like we have to daily choose the heart of God too. I asked you a question at the beginning. I, I wanna give you another one and I wanted to ask you to make this one personal, if you would. Maybe write it down and you can reflect on it even this week. But it's the question, am I trying to make a name for myself or make a name for him? Like in everything, uh, in my words and actions, in the way that you lead people, uh, in the way that you lead your home, are you living life to make a name for yourself or to make a name for God, a good name for him, to bring him glory? Or are we just seeking to satisfy our own needs? Let me give you a few examples of how this might play out before we close. Uh, maybe you've tried sharing your faith with uh, some people before, some friends, and, uh, and it didn't go well. It didn't go well at all. And, and you've endured some uh, rejection because of it, maybe some ridicule, again, because of your faith in Jesus. Making a name for yourself uh, means fighting back. It could mean rejecting your friends altogether, or because you tried sharing your faith once and it didn't go well, you're never going to do it again. You're never going to bring it up. Making a name for God, it takes just enough humility, patience and courage and a commitment to keep on praying. And it's just a reminder that your faithfulness in living for Jesus is so much more important than the results or what comes from it. But our desire is I, I wanna bring God glory in every circumstance, in every conversation. How about this one? Uh, picture a situation at work. You uh, expressed an idea in a meeting or something. 
And what do you know? The right people took your idea. They loved it. They're acting on it. Good things are coming from it. But guess what? Somewhere along the way, you were forgotten. You got left behind. Maybe even someone else took credit for your idea. Uh, Making a name for yourself might mean coming unglued, losing your mind, allowing bitterness to rule inside of you. Making a name for God requires just enough humility that you let it go and you just keep trusting that God has all of your best needs uh, in his mind. Or how about this? Suppose you and, and your spouse or a loved one, you get into this big disagreement or argument and all of a sudden he just launches into this long list of everything that you've ever done wrong. Making a name for yourself means you're locked and loaded and you are ready to dish it right back. But making a name for God means humbling yourself, listening and realizing that two wrongs certainly don't make anything right. Or imagine this one for just a moment. Imagine if you would that we're living in a pandemic, all right? Just use your imagination for a moment that we're all living in a pandemic and everything's changing and you're frustrated Stuff's canceled or on hold. You're watching all of the goings on in the media and the press and how it's impacting or could impact our country and our world. Making a name for yourself declares it's war. Dig in, dig the trenches. Separate yourself and your family from everyone. Look out for your own needs and just hang in there and survive until Jesus comes back. But making a name for God says, you know what, you and I are a big part of God's redemption plan in this world. In the same way, we are called to be a light to the nations, to shine the light of Jesus. And the good news is what the world needs right now, that prisoners can be set free, that captives can be released, that there is sight for the blind, that people can find their way back to God. This is the message and the hope of Jesus. And it's his heart. And it's the heart he wants each of us to have and it's what he wants to accomplish in you and what he wants to accomplish in me. Friends, Jesus wasn't trying to make a name for himself, but for God. And you and I, we are called humbly to do the same, to live for Jesus in all things. And so let me just end with the question that we opened with. It's yours. It's yours to ask what God might want it to mean in your life. And that is, what if your heart was replaced by the heart of Christ? What would you be like? What's he want to do in me and through our church? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the wonderful and great model that we have in Jesus Christ that in looking to him and studying him we can learn about our own life and our own circumstances and how we should live in this world and I pray that as followers of Jesus that we'd be willing to do that that we're not just reading for information but that we're reading and really seeking and wanting to ask okay what does this mean for me what does this look like in my life today Father show us show us what that looks like today Show us what that looks like for this afternoon and for tomorrow to know and to live for Jesus and to bring you glory, God, in all that we do. But Lord, I pray also that you would remind us that it's one thing to seek to model our lives after Jesus, but if we don't have the heart of Christ, if we've never trusted you with our life before, that we're missing the whole point. And in that, and as we pray today, I just want to talk to those of you that have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, You've never opened your life to him. You've never gone to him for forgiveness. I I want you to know that God wants to give you life. Uh, He wants to give you hope. He wants to put a new heart inside of you and forgive you of your sins and to give you eternal life now and for always. And he, he bought you at a price. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. And maybe you need to receive that today. And just pray and say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I need your forgiveness. I need your redemption. Man, I'd encourage you to pray a prayer like that. He knows our heart. He will respond to you. And we've got people that would love to help in that. You can reach out even online right now. You can catch a staff member after the service today. We'd love to talk and pray with you about 
the wonderful news of receiving Christ as Savior. And Father, we thank you for your work. We thank you for your work in each of us. We thank you for your patience in us. We thank you for the gift of your presence. We thank you for Jesus, our model. We want to live with the heart of Christ in all that we do to make your name great, Lord. There is nothing you can't do. We are putting our faith in you and we are believing you for great and amazing things in our lives, in our families, in our communities, and in our school and in our church and all around the world right now, Lord. We are believing and trusting you for great things. Give us faith, give us hope and trust in you for each of these. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.